Kale from the East Kingdom. Uh, I, uh, about 20 years ago, I had a very energetic dog and I lived in Philadelphia and um, I learned about dog driving and I was in the SCA. So I, I went down the, the rabbit hole that you're not supposed to go down in research is uh, try to document something that um, Rich, try to document something that may not really exist in period. So I spent a bunch of time and I actually was able to document dog driving in period, but there isn't a whole lot of information. And I became very intrigued by the technology in wheeled vehicles and really just got into it and pretty much read everything I could get my hands on and I had a cousin, an older cousin who has a, a PhD in um, Egyptology from the University of Pennsylvania. And I did some talking with her and she very kindly took me over to the University of Pennsylvania and their archeology span library. And the uh, section on, um, on chariots at the library, I had every single book in my own possession. So I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna talk about um, wheeled vehicles and um, bring that information into the SCA. Uh, so um, this talk, can everybody see my screen on my presentation? We can see yeah. your screen. Yeah. Okay, terrific. So I'm, um, so this is my first slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna talk about um, luxury, what I call luxury travel wagons. They've existed uh, since the Roman Empire um, up until, I guess uh, you could say present day. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the changes in technology and the cultural attitudes towards um, traveling in, you know, the upper classes towards traveling in um, up very much uh, luxury vehicles. So uh, it's an introduction um, prior to 1601, which is the end of the, uh, the period, the official end of the period for the um, SCA. Um, it's not a woodworking class. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what makes up a, a, a wheeled vehicle, what, what makes it distinct from more modern vehicles but I'm not gonna talk about um, woodworking skills. Uh, I am gonna talk a little bit about some plans, but I'm not a woodworker. Uh, I work with my friends to help me um, with my projects, but I am not a woodworker. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, luxury wagon styles, um, their uh, attitudes, starting during the Roman Empire, gonna talk um, in the Middle Ages, and then during the start of the Renaissance or the end of the SCA period. And um, if I'm not out of time, um, I can also switch to talking a little bit about um, the ancient draft harness and um, the medieval draft harness that um, has aspects that look very familiar today. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some definitions so that everybody is clear and on the same page. Um, I took these definitions from um, the readings that I um, had for, was it Mary Littower and et al. Um, so these are the uh, definitions that are agreed upon by the archeologists who specialize in wheeled vehicles. So a cart is defined as having two wheels. A wagon has four wheels. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so a chariot is a two-wheeled vehicle. It's a cart, but it's uh, a specialized cart. Um, during the, the ancient period or the classical period, it was the uh, sports vehicle. 
or, or the race car of that time. Um, to, for a more comfortable ride, you stood up on it and <laughs> used your legs and your knees to give you um, a, a more comfortable ride with it. They are always pulled by two or more um, draft animals. The draft animals could be uh, horses, mules, um, donkeys, uh, and, and I have even found, you know, since my interest is in um, dogs, I have even found um, evidence of children playing um, with child-sized chariots pulled by dogs. And in fact, there were some, um, uh, for at the Children's Fest, there was a spring festival that had a day of children's activities and they had um, dog chariot races with those. So, um, so um, this is not to say that in the, um, the uh, classical period that there were carts that people sat on and there were wagons that people sat on, but the chariots were the sports cars. Um, a litter is pretty much poles that are carried, that are used to carry something. In this image, we've got um, an older, I assume a king or somebody of high status. He's being carried on a litter um, that's held up by two horses for that. And um, the advantage of a litter is with long poles, if you've ever um, put a, a, a board uh, across two cinder blocks and stood on them, and you get this kind of bouncy action. So that gives you a, a nice uh, suspension, a primitive type of suspension. So now um, a wheelbarrow is uh, evolved out of the litter where you replace one person carrying the litter with a wheel. They're balanced differently than with carts. The cargo weight is between the person who's holding the wheelbarrow and the wheel, where with carts, you, um, most of the cargo weight is sitting over the axle. So um, now I'm gonna go forward and talk a little bit about the um, Roman coach. I, I love this vehicle, it's just fantastic. Uh, so the Roman coach was a high point in technology. It's got uh, a suspended body. It's got um, shrunk on metal um, hoop tires. Uh, it's got um, steam bent um, fellows on the wheels and it's got a metal kingpin in, um, in the front axle. So here's some diagrams that were created uh, to document them. So as you can see here, we've got um, these fellows, the rims, they are steam bent. And um, we've got a seat for the driver. And we have some suspension going here with, uh, I think, leather. So you've got... Right. Yes. So we've got um, so we've got these metal supports. We've got this uh, leather thur braces. I think that's what that's called for that the body of the wagon sits on, which is very sim uh, similar to the uh, modern coaches. And we've got this metal kingpin that goes right through the center of the front axle that allows the front axle to pivot. Um, the early wagons uh, that, you, that the archeologists have um, found in the graves in the steps have uh, four wheels and the front axle does not pivot at all, which is okay when you're out you know, in areas with no trees and it's flat, you can make large turns. So um, the, this is a, I don't know, I, I just find this very, very fascinating. And then here's a, a bottom view 
of it. You've got your uh, axle, and then here's your kingpin here, and it can all um, pivot. So um, the late Roman period was a, a high point in technology and metalworking. Then you have the fall of the Roman Empire, and uh, there was a loss of technology. And you can see that um, also it's uh, once you move to areas out that became Christianized, um, the archeological information um, is lacking because as areas became Christianized, people stopped burying vehicles in graves. Um, the church seems to have frowned upon burying a whole lot of things in your grave. I, I think they felt that it was better to uh, give your goods to the church than it was to bury them. I'm not sure, but that's um, what happened. So then so we have the, um, the ninth century Oseberg wagon that came out of the Oseberg ship grave, um, which uh, was an area that um, had yet to become Christianized. So it's one of the last uh, areas that the archeologists um, are still finding um, wagons in graves. I'm not sure if that's the correct way. Anyway, I like this black and white picture because um, this is an old museum picture, but it shows the horses that were found in the grave with the wagon. And we have a picture of um, this man standing next to it. So it gives you a better uh, idea of proportions of the wagon. I've seen some books where they've, um, I've seen books where they, um, the, where the artist, where they had artists um, try to make drawings of it and, um, you know, in everyday pictures. And they seem to make it look like it's a little um, radio flyer wagon. So I like this picture because it shows it's, it is significantly larger than a radio flyer wagon. So um, by the time of the Oseberg ship grave, um, we have a, a low point um, in uh, wagon technology uh, due to the scarcity of metals and a decline in metalworking skills. But they but just because they had a decline in metalworking doesn't mean that they wanted to give up all the um, uh, all the technology that they had. So instead of using a metal kingpin, they put in a um, a wood kingpin. So right here, you can see this right here is the where the kingpin is. Um, so we have the Oseberg wagon. We have um, no metal tires. Well, you got your phone plugged in. We've got uh, fellows that are pierced together instead oh. of um, steam vents. We have um, no metal supports for the body. They're just wood supports and there's no suspension for the body. But we know that this is a um, a very luxurious wagon because it's got Somebody spent a huge amount of time um, carving it, um, decorating it. So I mean, these are the pictures from um, the book about the archaeological find that was published in 1928. So we can see here, here's the wood supports for the body. The body just lifts off. And the uh, undercarriage, as you, as you can see here. So here's a side um, picture of it. So you've got the, uh, the wood supports, the body lifts off. And as you can see here, the wheels are pieced together in multiple sections. They're not steam bent at all. There's no metal um, tires on it. Again, you can see this, um, the undercarriage, the body just slips right down on top of it. 
I have a dog size model of it and it, it works pretty well. I used to take it to events. In fact, I bought it from um, uh, one of the vendors at Penzik and he had used it for several years before I got mine, before I got it. So here's um, the front and back view. You can see this kingpin right here. And we've got these little mysterious uh, pieces of wood that come out here. I think those are part of what's used so that you could put a tarp on top of it. You can put your um, cargo in there and put a tarp on it and then you can take rope and tie it down. And I think that's what these are for, they're little tie down spots. So that was a low point. Uh, this is um, the wagon in the Latrell Psalter. Uh, it's a 14th um, century image. So um, by this time, um, there's not a lot of extent vehicles um, around. So the archaeologists are able to, um, you know, pull vehicles or study the archaeological remains in graves, in non-Christian graves. We, we're hitting a period of time where um, we, uh, they just don't exist anymore. And then later on, um, the early coaches, uh, there's still some really early coaches that are in um, the carriage uh, museums and royal muses of Europe. But we're, right now we're kind of in a dearth of information of extent vehicles. So um, you have to turn to the art, art and take a look at that. Um, I also want to say that during the, um, the classical period, men and high status men and women traveled in luxury vehicles. When you get to the middle ages, the roads um, have declined and pretty much the only people, only um, people of high status that are riding in um, wheeled vehicles are women and the clergy. Uh, if you were an upper class man, the cultural view was that you were effeminate if you were riding in these luxury vehicles. You know, real men ride horses. And um, so that's the reason why I've titled this talk, Ladies Luxury Travel Wagons. Because for uh, most people in the SCA, um, don't do a Roman period, they do medieval and um, up to the sixth, the Tudor period, the 16th century. So um, from this image, you can see that you've got a covering over the wagon, a co you know, it's a, it's a covered wagon and it's got luxury uh, fabrics in it. It's beautifully decorated. And you've got the ladies are, you know, the ladies are traveling here, got decorations. Um, you've got this man, he's giving back, you know, the lady lost her little miniature dog, he's giving it back to her. So um, when you look at these images, you don't want to overinterpret, but you need to have knowledge of vehicles to understand what you're looking at. So um, I believe at this time, the artists are trying to show, one of the ways that the artists are trying to show um, that this wagon is a, a luxury wagon. Not only is it the fabrics and the carvings, but you also have the wheels. So you've got these um, metal wheels, metal tires, excuse me, on the wheels. As you can see here, we've got um, little knobby things going on. And I believe that those are indications of straight metal tires. And what they are is that they're pieces of um, metal that are nailed on to the fellow. 
and the artists are emphasizing the nails by making them look knobby because this is um, expensive metal that could be better used um, for defense, for clouds, etc. So they're using, uh, you know, this is a very luxurious use of, of an expensive item. So here's another picture um, from 1348. Again, you can see, you know, here are the two ladies. You've got these uh, fabric coverings. The artist is showing the uh, straight uh, tires with the um, nails that are um, with the nails. And let's see. And you can see these little um, these little uh, lines here, which I interpret as being um, showing that the wheels are are not steam bent; they're pieced together. There's another image. Uh, I also think this is kind of interesting here. We've got a single swingle tree instead of a double tree for this four in hand. So we we're wondering what's under those fabrics? You know, for the fabric tires, I mean, for the fabric covers on these covered luxury ladies wagons. So here we have a picture of these people that are being drawn into hell by these devil creatures, demons, whatever, and they don't have um, a fabric covering on their wagon. So it looks like, you know, you've got these hoops with straight um, wood. That's what's holding the, the covers, the fabric covers up. And then here's another image. Again, we've got these beautiful ladies, uh, upper class men. I'm not sure exactly who's what's going on with the hairy guy. But did you also notice that we don't have people sitting on, we don't have men sitting on the wagons driving the horses. They're usually sitting on the horses. So again, here we have a, a lady traveling in her luxury wagon. Her driver is sitting on the horse, which is different from what they were doing in the Roman period where they were sitting on in a driver's seat on the front of the wagon or the coach, I should say. But the thing with these is that there's no suspension. There's no... Um, the, way, the body is on the axles, there's no, you know, your suspension is your, your pillows that you're sitting on. So again, I like this image because um, this is Isabella of Bavaria. She's entering Paris. Um, she's about to, you know, um, she's traveled to Paris to get married to her future husband. Charles the sixth, and you can see a little bit of her wagon here, uh, and it, and her horse is just as beautifully um, adorned as you see with the upper class men riding their horses. Um, so there's another picture. So this is an interesting picture because it's usually don't see in the illustration what exactly is going on underneath the body. So what we have here is Pope John the 23rd, he had a carriage accident. And everybody thought this was extremely funny because, you know, this effeminate man of the clergy He's so effeminate, he's been traveling around in this, this wagon that only late 80s really ride in, not real men. And he had an accident. Well, he wouldn't have had an accident if he hadn't, you know, if he'd been riding like he should have been as a real man, but he had an accident. So there, and everybody's all in a, uh, an uproar because he had a carriage accident. But I'm happy about it because I get to see what's underneath these um, carriages. 
so we've got, the artist has been very nice and he's shown us that there's a kingpin. We've got the, this classic uh, V-shape here on the forecarriage that allows the axle to pivot. So, um, so this is about where we were in the Middle Ages. But surprise, surprise, suspension technology did have a holdout in Eastern Europe in what is now called, uh, when, what we now um, consider to be the modern Hungary area. So, and we have um, reports about it from um, various um, sources, mostly from the, um, the Moors world, not, not the Christian world. So we have a Spanish Jew, and I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I, I assume his name is Ibrahim something something. Anyway, he wrote of his travels um, amongst the uh, Western Slavs. He says, their kings ride in high rambling, excuse me, in big rambling high vehicles with four wheels and with four sturdy poles at the corners from which a brocade Aja is suspended by strong chains so that whoever sits on it does not feel the jolting. Um, and the Haja is um, defined by another Arabic writer as a conveyance for women roofed over by an art roofed over by arched wood. And this term became familiar as the Halda. Um, with the British Raj as a canopy seat for an elephant. So, um, well, that's very intriguing. Well, what does this look like? Uh, here's another description from the 13th century um, from a Frenchman um, who traveled overland from Belgrade to France. And he wrote a journal about his experiences which uh, one of my friends in the SCA very kindly translated for me because at the time it wasn't available on the internet. It probably is now. But anyway, her rough translation says, during my travels in Hungary, I often met with wagons on which six, seven, or even eight people sat, all pulled by a single horse. Since when they embark on long tr trips, they customarily hitch up only one horse. The rear wheels are taller than the front wheels. Their covers are quite pleasing. And these covered coaches are so light that anyone could carry them on his shoulders, wheels and all. So, um, so this, uh, th this became kind of interesting and it became a fad and by the 15th or 16th century to display one's wealth by owning such a wagon with a suspended body. So we're gonna go take a look at what these early coaches look like. Say it wrong way. So this is what uh, one of the illustrations from the 14th century. So we've got a, uh, a body that looks like it's some sort of a, a woven um, basketry wicker um, look to it. We've got the, um, the, the hoop cover, you know, to hold up the um, covering. Uh, this illustration shows, I think, I think it's a sign of uh, a four in hand, but it's probably, it may be just two horses. But we've got um, suspension again, we've got support, and we've got a bunch of ladies traveling in it. So um, Hawk, or C-O-C-S, I think that's pronounced Hawk, is a village in Hungary from which the word coach is derived. Um, this photograph is somebody's um, reproduction of an early coach from Hawk. Uh, I grabbed this image off of a web page a number of years ago. Somebody uh, was trying to illustrate what, um, what they look like. 
So we've got two, what's it, three, four, three there. Um, horses pulling it. Um, it's kind of got a look that's sort of similar to what we think of with the um, the Troika wagons in Russia, where you've got traces and the ability to pull both the front axle as well as the rear wheels. Um, this is another picture of a wagon. And you can see this uh, strut on the outsides of the um, hub here that's supporting the body. And then I had the, the uh, great joy of having gone to Martin's Carriage Auction. Martin's Carriage Auction is held um, currently twice a year in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And when I can get time off from work, I, I love to go to it because it's a place where um, I, you, you see all sorts of um, carriages come through. And um, while I like going to carriage museums, auctions are wonderful because everybody, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not frowned upon if you take your camera and you crawl underneath them and take pictures from all sorts of angles. Um, so I was really excited to see this. Um, so yeah, I was really excited to see this um, carriage because a lot of people, they see these struts on the outside of the, um, the hub and they assume because of that, the front axle can't pivot. But what, what's going on is that it has a pivot point up here. So this axle is um, pivoted, it's making a turn and it accommodates the strut. So when the axle is in line with the rear axle, this um, strut here is vertical and then when it turns, it, it, it's at an angle. So uh, I, th this is to me an illustration of why you have to be careful of over, you know, of how you interpret um, images because it's easy from this image to, to just assume, hey, you can't, that front axle can't turn, but I believe it can. So this is, uh, I was really excited when I found this image. This is a, uh, from a fresco in um, a castle in Northern Italy. So we've got uh, La Manta Castle. And you, it's a very much a, a, an early coach. Let's see, uh, circa 1420. And you, you've got your, um, you got some chains suspending the body. You've got uh, these people are being, are, are old people, are, are sick people. They're on their journey to the fountain of youth. Uh, we've got the driver, he's still sitting on the horse to drive it. And then here's another one from the 15th century. Uh, this belonged to Eleanor, um, wife of the Austrian Emperor Sigismund. Um, he's got a foreign hand hitch here. Again, um, the driver is not sitting on the carriage. We have the lady. Uh, it's adorned with her heraldry. Um, I think this is a um, this, uh, support for the suspension of the body. And the, the horses have full collars. So now we're getting into the 16th century where um, some of these early coaches are still surviving in the Royal Muses and the Carriage Museums of Europe. So this is um, one of the, this one is just the body, but as you can see, it's just, totally encrusted with decorations and heraldry. Um, you know, as you can see, you got the heraldry here and here it is all along there. And 
here's another image of it. Um, again, I grabbed these off of the internet a few years ago. They're just absolutely incredible. And then here's one from uh, 1560. We've got the, uh, the, you know, the supports for suspending the carriage body on it. So we, so we've got this fad for um, travel for showing off your wealth uh, by owning a um, a coach. You know, it's a fantastic way of showing off your wealth um, and traveling in, in comfort. So now we we have this culture where real men ride horses and they don't ride around in carriages or in coaches. That's that's not. So there's writings in the six, in the 15th and 16th century talking about the downfall of our youth, our young men. They're not being manly. They're riding around in these coaches, and and we, or they're not real men. And we don't. It's it was very controversial. But uh, yeah, but you know. Old people are get to be old fashioned in their be, blue, beliefs and the, the young people thought this was a fantastic thing to do. And um, we also have an increase in trade into cities. So we had started having carriage jams in the cities. Let's see, let's go here. Oh, here's another one. There's just some really just beautiful and then here, this is just post 1601. This is a, a what? Um, uh, uh, it's called the Stockholm Roll, and it's um, it's all about the wedding procession um, of uh, the marriage of Constance of Austria and and Sigismund uh, into um, at, in Krakow, and it's a, it's a long. Um, it's a long painting and it's got multiple pictures of these carriages in them, but we've got um, upper class men and women riding in these. So it has become more acceptable. So one of the things that I wanted to um, talk about is that um, there's something called, um, some people call them um, gardos, other people call them gypsy wagons. They're um, traveling, living, traveling wagons with living quarters uh, used by the gypsies, especially in um, England. And while they're traveling vehicles, they're not really appropriate for pre-1601 because the gypsies in the UK only started using them in the mid 19th century. Prior to that, they were living in what were called bender tents, and they used um, pack horses and pack donkeys for um, traveling um, around. And, um, and they're beautifully decorated and they're wonderful, but uh, I just like to make sure that people are aware of these beautiful vehicles that are actually period and, um, you know, I would like people to be, to think of them, you know, if they're starting a new project for doing, uh, for camping in a, um, in a wagon. Because these, these are just absolutely uh, gorgeous. I would love to see at Pendic one, you know, something like the ladies, um, yeah, like the Littauer, um, Littauer, um wagon. I, I would just love to see that. Um, I have no evidence for what's exactly inside of these wagons, so um, I don't have any problem with being inspired by um, how they're set, how the um, gypsy wagons are set up for living in and being inspired by those for making them, but uh, I, I just think it would be wonderful if we did something that um, is more period appropriate. And, and they're just beautiful. 
So let me get back here. Oops, oh God, I went the wrong direction. Apologize. So since I have an interest in dog vehicles, and I actually have an interest in um, goat vehicles, and um, in the, the little child-sized carriages that were used by children, uh, I want to end with saying that um, in the 17th century, um, children's portraits um, started, you started seeing miniature versions of coaches in the children's portraits. And in fact, in 1608, the seven-year-old um, future Louis XIII of France was given a dog carriage. Um, thus, by when you start giving upper-class boys uh, things, uh, that's usually a sign that they're fully acceptable um, in the culture. So the fact that the um, you know the heir to the to the throne of France was given one of these shows that by the uh, by the end of the SCA period, they were fully um, fully it was fully acceptable for upper class men to be riding in coaches. Where are we? Oops. How are we doing time wise? Okay. You've got about 10 more minutes. All right, good. So. All right, well, thank you for um, listening to my talk about um, ladies' luxury travel wagons. Um, my name is Lady Rachel of Bikale. My real name is Rebecca Morris. Uh, I'm a member of the Carriage Association of America. Um, I became a member because uh, Joe Ryder was so very supportive of my research, um, which I, I'm very thankful for her and the, SC, and, um, the Carriage Association of America in general. Um, you can reach me at my email address. You can also reach me uh, via uh, Elsie's and my group on Facebook called SCA Related Pre-1601 Vehicles and Packing Interest Group. And um, this picture was taken of me several years ago and um, it's the, it shows you my previous dog. It was a, a child golden retriever mix and my model of the Oseberg wagon, which is a you know, child size um, hand pull wagon, which I used to take to events and I had a lot of fun with it. I now have a St. Bernard and um, this wagon is a little too small for my St. Bernard. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, I can talk a little bit about um, harness and a little bit about wheels, the, the development of um, wheels. You had one person who asked for a copy of your handout class notes, your presentation. Would you want them to send a request to the email that you posted in the, uh, with your presentation? I, we, I'm quite happy to do that. Um, I already have a PDF on our pre-1601, uh, our six, yeah, pre-1601 uh, Facebook group there. So yeah, that would work. Our, Medieval Carriage Symposium with you. I, I've uh, mentioned several times in person, and uh, it's great to uh, actually see your presentation today. Thank you very much. So do we want to take a break, or?
in about five minutes, we'll switch over and prepare the uh, next class and get them going. Okay. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about chariots. So um, there were two different types of uh, chariot harnesses. There's the um, neck yoke, and then there's the dorsal yoke. And um, this is uh, right here are some diagrams from early harness systems by Jean Sprott. He's a Frenchman who is just my hero. He wrote this book called Early Harness Systems in French and Mary Littauer translated it into English. It's full of wonderful illustrations. And he is a experimental archaeologist or was an experimental archaeologist who uh, was just very interested in early harness systems and he experimented uh, with some really weird early stuff. Anyway, these images are from his book. So um, this is the image showing the neck yoke where the traction is um, on the, the collar area on the shoulder area, and you show the dorsal yoke. And then this is a hybrid between the two of them. And in the 1930s, um, there was a man who wrote a, a, a book claiming that the, uh, the chariot harness system was ineffective and it choked the horse. And um, Sprott, in his book, Early Harness System, he disproves that theory although you do see it around in some um, later books. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, he proved that the, the man who wrote in the 1930s was confused and he disproved that it um, took the um, horse. So here's um, from the fifth century BC. It, this is a drawing um, of a yoke for horses that was um, found in one of the, uh, the graves uh, out in the steps. And um, this is an image uh, of, from a, um, a broken statue of a chariot, a bronze statue of a chariot. And then these are uh, right here, these line drawings are images of the dorsal yoke found in some um, graves. So these uh, fit on the, the back instead of being in the front of the shoulder. And what's neat about this, um, this fragment from this chariot um, statue is that you can see all the straps that um, for how it was tied onto the end of the pole. And the, the complicated um, knots, and et cetera, that was used with that. And then here's an image of a wagon um, from one of these um, frescoes, I guess you would call it, in Pompeii. It shows a wagon used to transport cargo. And you've got the two mules. And you can see at the end of the pole, this dorsal um, yoke. Um, one of the things about, um, it's my understanding, I'm not a woodworker, it's very, you have to be a very skilled woodworker to bake um, spoke wheels where the spokes radiate out from the center hub. And um, I like to encourage people that I run into who want to make their own wood wheels to try the crossbar wheel. It's, um, and as you can see um, here, we have a cart from, um, what was it, the seventh century. You've got this crossbar. So you've got the fellow You've got this bar that goes all the way across, and then you've got these supporting um, spokes, I guess you could call that, that go like that. And then here's a, a drawing based on some archaeological digs for it. 
and you've got, you know, it's a cart. It's not a chariot, it's a cart. So you have people actually sitting on it in a back-to-back, -back, sort of makes me think of, uh, what do we call that, uh, dog carts from the 19th century, you know, the back-to-back -back seating. And here's another picture of the crossbar wheel being used in the past. Uh, and this is, uh, so we, back to harnesses. So we had the, um, the neck chariot harness, the neck yoke chariot harness that was used mostly by the Egyptians and then the Greeks and the Romans used the, the dorsal yoke. Then um, in the Roman Gaul in the late Roman empire period, they developed single horse drafts. So up until that time, horses were kind of small. They pretty much hitched them in pairs. So in Gaul, they started developing the, the single horse draft and they developed this interesting um, early collar. So we've got this uh, metal um, bar that goes over the front of the the neck here, and it's all padded. And we have the shafts, they come up here and then they, they're bent up and they are connected to there. And then later on um, in the early middle ages, the full neck collar started to be developed and is a collar that looks very familiar to um, the full neck collar with the hames that we see today. So uh, I think that, that's all I have for now. Stop share. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll handle everything else. Mm -hmm. Thank you.